and hair sticking up everywhere and she was on stage and she was looking beautiful and she asked one powerful question. She said, what's love got to do with it? And her name is Tina Turner. <laughs> when I was in 1984, I was in my umpteenth year of college. <laughs> and I wanted to tell Tina Turner what love had to do with it. Because my understanding of love at 20 years old is completely different <laughs> than my understanding at my age now. But she begged the question. What's love got to do with it? And I think that is a beautiful question for we as a church to hear today. What's love got to do with it? It's a secondhand emotion is what she said. And we look at this text today and it has been abused and misused. In fact, if it was used in your wedding, would you raise your hand? Because I know it was used in mine and I have preached several weddings where they have definitely wanted that scripture and we have used it. But you know what? It's way out of context when you do that. It's a beautiful text. It's called the love chapter of Corinthians. And what's love got to do with it? Well, if you want to hear what Paul has to say about it, it's everything. It's everything about being church. It's everything about being a believer in God. It's everything. It is God's nature. It's everything about those of us who are going to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of life. Love is everything. Hear me say that again. Love is everything. It's the root of our understanding of who God is. It's God's nature. And if we're going to believe in God and be followers of Christ, what do we do but assume that nature? We have to be followers, which means we take on that persona. We, we go for that cause. We live for that dream. We live for that purpose. And God's purpose is to share love. Nothing more, nothing less. God's purpose for the world and for humanity is to understand that we are loved. Now, Paul writing this to a church that some of us can relate to because we've been in church for a long, long time. Have any of you ever sat in a church that was divisive? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> you don't even have to claim that maybe at one time it was this church. But just about every church I know has a chapter in their history where they were a divisive church. They were not believers in the gospel. Well, they said they were believers in the gospel. And they did do what Tina Turner said. They put love into a secondhand emotion. Because what they cared about was their own intentions was their own purpose, was their own agenda, was their own direction, was their own power play, was it was their church, and by golly, they were going to make it their church. Church doesn't belong to us. <clears throat> church belongs to the creator of love. And the creator of love, our God, calls us together as beings that God loves. Please hear that. We are called together as beings of God's love. Beings who are asked to emulate that love, to, to live into that love. Well, Paul had established the church in Corinth, and guess what? There were some power players. There were some people who wanted to, to say certain things about the church, and that you had to do certain things. You had to speak in tongues if you were going to be a believer, or you were going to have to do special things. And you, know, you had to have a healing touch if you were going to be a believer. You had to be circumcised if you were going to be a believer. And they were say, saying all these things, and the church wasn't growing together. It was growing apart. And a lot of times we as church, oh, we're guilty, aren't we? We're guilty because we get on our agenda and we think it needs to be our way and we drive it, we drive it, we drive it and it's just like a wedge. It splits the church. And that's not what God wants from us. That's not what Paul wanted for his church in Corinth. So he's speaking to a very divisive church. A church that needs a good healing and a good understanding. So what he says, he says, you know what? If we're going to do this work, if we're going to go out in the community and we're going to feed those who are hungry and we're going to clothe those who are naked and we're going to help those who are homeless and we're going to help those who can't afford in their housing and we're going to help provide housing for them and, and all of those good things, but we don't have love. 
You're nothing but a clanging gong or a vain cymbal. Now I remember when I was 12 years old, I wanted a drum set. And I began working for myself, I mean working in a job for my best friend's dad. And I made $10 a day, I worked 12 hours a day, and I made $10 a day. I was big money. I saved up $125 and my neighbor had a Ludwig trap set that I bought. And I put it in my room and I felt so sorry for my parents. Because I would put on my headphones to that good old rock and roll music of Aerosmith and Grand Funk Railroad and Three Dog Night. And I would just, I didn't know what I would do. I just went to banging the drums and hitting the cymbals until I had a few lessons and figured out. But I didn't make music at all. And that's what we do when we take on all the causes of the world, but we don't have love. We don't make music. We're terrible. Because all we're doing is to build ourselves up. And I don't know if you've read the Bible, but I don't think I've ever read a statement in the Bible that says, you need to believe in Jesus and accept the love of God so that you can build yourself up. What it says is that you should put on this verse. What it says is that you should relieve the oppressed. You should preach the good news. You should help the poor, clothe the naked, heal the blind. You should shine the light in so many different ways. You should be kind to one another, as Dakota said this morning. But you should do it from an attitude of love. The very core of your being should be like God's being. And you should move and your actions should be from love, not from self-ambition, not from making yourself look better than somebody else, because if that's what you're doing, then you just made all that effort not worthwhile. You've made it a second-hand effort. And what Paul wants to tell the church is, God, we've got to quit. We've got to quit trying to do things for ourselves and dividing the church. It's the early church. We need to be together as one. Folks, today in this world, the church needs us to be together as one. We are a wounded church. And if you don't know universally, we are a, unit, a wounded church, especially this week. And we should be on our knees praying for one another. Praying for those who have been named. Praying for churches who are suffering from leadership that went astray. Forgiving those who have done wrong. We need to be living from an attitude of love in this world. Because we are a wounded church. Every one of us who are sitting on the pews are wounded individuals. Because what we need is love. And if we can't receive love, then how can we give love? Because God is love, and if we're going to accept Jesus as the Christ, then we have to receive love. Do you know the greatest need I hear when I'm talking to people? I needed my daddy to love me. I needed my mama to love me. I needed my wife to love me. I needed my brother to love me. I needed my sister to love me. I needed my husband to love me to love me. I needed my partner to love me. Do you hear what people are asking for in this world? Every one of us in the very core of our being we need to be loved. We need to be loved and it doesn't need to be with a romantic love. That's not what fulfills our spirit. It's the spirit of God that fulfills us and if we can't open ourselves we are so misguided. We think we need the love of another human being to fulfill us and sustain us. But the truth of the matter is, we need the love of God. We need to get ourselves out of our own picture and allow God to come in and refresh us and renew us. Do you know that God said during creation, every day when He was through, what did He say? He said, this is good. He would create the stars and the sky and form of the earth and he would say it was good and then he would create all the animals and all the earth and the fishes and the plants and he would say this is good but there was a time when he created humankind male and female alike he created them in his image and you know what he said on that day and I think human beings we forget this 
And it's why we struggle as a church, because we don't receive the fullness of God's love. God stated on that day, this is very good. Do you hear that? God said when God created us as human beings, it was above what he had already created. He said this is very good. Most excellent. He created us in God's image. We are created male and female alike. And God wants nothing more than to love us. And we need to open the doors to love and let love live in us. Because we can't be a vessel of love if we haven't received love. If we're walking around with our woundedness guiding our lives, then all we're doing is hurting other people. And we're living a false witness in our life. So Paul addresses it with his church and he says, guys... Quit it. Quit banging on those symbols. My dad used to come up and get, I'd have my headphones on and I'd be just rocking. <laughs> and I'd hear this, bam, 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 bam. Oh, my door, if my music was full more, my drums were flying, it'd be my dad, and I'd open the door and he'd go, could you be a little quieter, please? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir, because I didn't want him to come up there a second time. <laughs> We need to let go of all that stuff that's keeping us out of contact with God. We need to quit living a false witness to the world. And we need to be a church that loves people because we understand that we are loved. We need to understand that the very core of our being is different as all of us are. We are loved. God breathed in us. God created us. God made us. And God said we're very good. And God loves us. Even on our worst day. When we think we're unlovable, God loves us. It's the message of the gospel. And Paul says, folks, if you're going to be messengers of the, of the gospel and you're going to love others, then you need to understand what love is. What's love got to do with it? It's got a lot to do with it. And he goes into this paragraph and he writes that love is a verb. Did you read that? It said in there, you teachers out there, love is a verb. Fifteen different things he says. Fifteen different verbs he uses to describe love. Seven of them are good and eight of them are bad. And I'm going to pick up a Bible because my memory doesn't let me gather all of them. I get lost. And he says, love is patient. Are you patient? Love is kind. Love is love delights, rejoices in the truth. Love protects. Love trusts. Love hopes. Love always perseveres. Think about that. If we can just practice those seven good verbs, what a difference that will make in our lives. Just think of everybody you address, you address, address them with kindness and patience. Just start right there. If you address them with kindness and patience, and then what you did was you trusted them to tell you the truth, and you rejoiced with them as they told you the truth. It says love, love doesn't delight in evil. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. We don't bury the hatchet with the handle sticking out if we love somebody. We don't keep a record of their wrongs. We don't delight in evil. We're not selfish. It doesn't boast. Love is about caring for somebody else in the best way possible. Love always. Do you hear that description? It doesn't say on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or maybe on Sunday only. It says always, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, Love does, to put it in Bob Goff's language. Love does. Love's kind. Love cares for other people. Love trusts. Love protects. And here's the most beautiful one because I think it describes God fully. Love perseveres. Perseveres. Now I've learned something in this country. I've had to go buy a new pair of shoes. Do you know what they are? They're called muck boots. Because if I wear my good shoes outside in all of this wonderful rain, my good shoes get ruined. 
and they don't persevere through the journey because they're just like totally covered in mud and then the seams get all wet and dry out and they rot and next thing I know I've got to go buy another but I can buy some muck boots and I can put them on and I can walk through the muddiest holes I can go through whatever I need to go through and you know what those old muck boots persevere God's love the same way God will walk through the deepest, darkest, muddiest hole you can find. And God's love will be in you wherever you're at. No matter what's going on, no matter what somebody said to you, no matter what jam you've got yourself in, no matter what, what list your name has been written on, no matter what, God's love never fails. And God's love perseveres. And God will walk through you that calling out. God will walk through you in that jam. God will walk with you so that you can shine the light to other people. Because there's nothing prettier than to, to see a light that has come new. Somebody who has walked with their mud, their mud boots and they've walked through that mud and that dirt and that ugliness in their lives. And they've come out on the other side understanding that they're loved by God. And that they're a vessel of God to share with others. And they become this beacon that goes out into all the world. And shines a light that changes people's by, lives and they don't care if their name's ever mentioned. They don't care if they give one newspaper article or one picture or one Facebook post. They don't, they don't care. What they care about is that lives have been changed because God changed their life. And they're able to change somebody else's life because they understand what love has to do with it. And I think when we think about God and we think about what, what Paul's saying to his church and what he's calling his church to do, he's asking them to embrace love. Don't judge. Embrace love. And I think when he starts to wrap it up, he says, you know, we can go through life and we can listen to prophecies and we can listen to tongues and we can watch the spiritual gifts, but all that's going to go away. Because in the end, we're going to be face to face with that beacon of light. The beacon of light that created us. That breathed life into us. That said we are very good. That walked through the muddy muck with us. And that continues to love us. And in the end, there are three things that are going to matter. That we have faith. That we were hopeful. But most of all, that we understand love. Because Paul says the greatest of those three is love. Church, we have a responsibility as people of God to open ourselves up to the love of God so that God will walk through, walk with us through life. And we are able to share that love with everybody else. And we don't care who gets the credit. We don't care whose name is called. What we care about is that God was present. And we were used as God's vessel. In 1967, a group of boys got together and they released a song. that said, all we need is love. The Beatles. All we need is love. Love, love, love. All we need is love. And the greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen.